So um, basically, today um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some applications of of CNNs, and we're gonna discuss some of the recent state of the art CNN models. This is very practical and application oriented. So I thought it would be beneficial for you guys to know that. First of all, let's have a look at this link that I put out last time. So if you click on this, you're gonna be going somewhere here. Let me just bring that up. The other side. So it's a very small scale neural net, right? That uses your browser's resources to train the model you define here. It's based on Confident GS, so it just, it's a JavaScript uh, program. It has been written by Andre Carpacci, who I mentioned he's a he's the AI uh, director at Tesla now. Used to be a PhD at Stanford. So this is your uh, training data, right? So you have two classes, green and red. So let's just get rid of this one in the middle, so we have only one layer. Okay. So now I've got uh, some data, green and red, and I have six units on my first layer, and then I have my softmax, which outputs two classes, right? So this one has six neurons. The activation is hyperbolic tangent, and I have two classes, okay? And these are a bunch of hyperparameters, momentum, learning rate, batch size, and decay. We can play around. First of all, can someone tell me, so these are two classes. This is the data, and this is a projection of that data, right? So now you see that this was able to classify green and red with six units of neurons, right, in one layer. First of all, can anyone tell me what's the minimum needed to correctly classify this nonlinear data? Can anyone have a guess? Say if I put it to one, mm -hmm. do you think, is it going to learn something? So let's try that. If I put this one, six to one, you see I'm missing something. And it keeps learning and learning. It is training itself. So you have some misclassifications here. You have very So the, the learning, uh, the, the, actually, the accuracy is not good. So any ideas? What's the minimum? Why three? Uh, do we have other ideas? So if I, if I put instead of one, I put, let's say, 10. Let's see what's going to happen. So it can perfectly classify this. It's get, it keeps training using the, the hyperparameters. If we just change the learning rate, I don't know, from 0 0.01, 0 0.01 to just 1, it might start faster, but it's going to go very slow. In this case, we have overkill, actually, because we have 10. So your friend is, is saying 3. Let's try that. Right, let's get back the learning rate to 0 0.01. Yeah, that was the answer because you yeah, actually by having one perceptron here, one there, and one there, just like a peak, right? A peak shape, you were able to learn. And then you see you have co correctly classified two classes. If I were to put two, it wouldn't be enough. I would have missed some classes, uh, some instances, right? Like here and here. That's why in the projection you see there are some misclassifications. So it's a very nice tool to play around with the hyperparameter. You can define your layers here. And you see now I'm a fan of CPU has started working because it's using my resources to train on a browser. So it's, it's very neat and uh, easy to understand. You can play around with hyperparameter with the learning rate. And you see what are the differences between um, regularizing and changing the, the way the stochastic gradient descent is training and play around with your activation function and so on and so forth. So it's pretty easy. So I thought it would be a nice thing to play around. All right.
So you see by by increasing the uh, the trainable units, we might be able to classify more complex data, right? But at the same time, even without the increasing those, right? If I play around with hyperparameter of regularization, I'm able to just fine tune some of the pitfalls and issues that my lower, uh, you know, my fewer sort of uh, trainable neurons had as an issue right here. Now, if I play around correctly and find the right hyperparameter, you see that by regularizing this with the alpha, uh, with the lambda here, I'm able to just sort of fine-tune my classification towards the regions that were needed to be learned, okay? It helps me sometimes to avoid overfitting, or on the other side, it might just put me in an overfitting position. So you have to find a tra uh, trade-off normally by cross-validation. So you can, it's up to you to play around with this code, so. All right, so the bulk of the talk of today is we're gonna have a short review of the state of the art CNNs. We're gonna start from Lenet, one of the eldest one, and then we go from to AlexNet, and then Inception or GoogleNet, and then finally we wrap up with ResNet. Okay, just close the door. All right, so last lecture I was talking about the, the advancement of CNNs throughout time, and then as of 2010 when the, when the ILSBRC, or the ImageNet Challenge recognition started, people have been using hand-tuned CNNs uh, in order to classify those thousand classes. But out of a sudden, 2012 AlexNet um, came out, and then it could outperform by 10% the, the existing competitor, and then it, it, it won the price. So just before starting AlexNet, let's just um, flash back to Lenet and see where it was uh, started, actually. A good, right, sort of, um, um, I would say, industrial uh, CNN. So Lenet started in 1995, the first version. And then it came, uh, came back upgraded and revised every year up to 98, which was the Lenet 5. So this is the Lenet 5 model by Jan LeCun, who is now the head of AI at Facebook. Um, he was also among the three guys who got the, the Turing Award this year with Jeffrey Hinton and Yusha Benjo. So um, you see he was able to classify the handwritten digits, uh, the, the classify this gradient scale uh, classes of um, letters, right? So the input was 32 by 32, and the output was 10 classes, because we were, uh, actually, this is not correct. It should be 100 digits, the actual application of MNIST. So if you um, sort of break it down, if we start looking at the first layer, the convolution number one, or conv1, so we're going to see that the COM1 was receiving an input of 32 by 32 and 1. Why this is 1 here? Grayscale. Yeah, because we only have one channel, which is grayscale, right? This could be the, the scale of gray. I'm not sure if it's from 1 to 256, 55, or to up to 128. So one end is like 0, and the other one is like white. So for each of the pixels, you have this channel in... in um, in an RGB or the other type of uh, channel-wise color, uh, you have more channels, okay? You can even add more than three or five. You might see some convolutions has more channels as well. So, the convolution one, we call it here C1, right? It had six filters. So it was receiving 28, uh, so it was actually producing as output, 28, 28, and 6. So the, the filter size inside this channel, inside this actually layer, 
was 5 so each of them are 5 and you have 6 of those so it has 6 channels in order to distinguish them they are in different colors so like so this is the, the first one you see and then the second, third, fourth and fifth so that's the that's the filter side okay and then we are convolving each of them in a loop this one to this so it's starting from this going right and down and down right so it's going to produce here and then up to the last one you do it again you convolve it as cross correlation that I mentioned in, in a previous ex, um, lecture and it's going to produce the the other end right so the trainable parameters if we multiply this 5 and 5 so that's why you have 5 multiply 5 right you have the 1 here that was the number of channels of the input because your input was only a you could it, it could be considered as a 2d right it didn't have anything in 3d itself that's why it's 1 and then that's going to be the number of times you should have been doing this six times you have six channels the last one is just the bias term plus six right or six multiply one bias that's why in order to compute the number of trainable uh, parameters or the number of weights of a, of a such layer you have to multiply it this way so using this the number of connections in neurons right to the next layer so this number of connections almost is 28 28 multiply 156 because each of those should be a trainable item right this is 122k okay and that's actually uh, so one is representing the number of parameters from the other one you can gain knowledge what are the the, the needed max for that okay so you can we can define all of these math simple math for all the layers but I thought uh, we can fast forward to the last layer so you see we have two convolutions so this one comb one and then I'm sorry we had more convolutions up to count three but these last layers are fully connected layers right you see full connections they're FC layers these are conv so fast forward to the last one this is what you see in a normal neural network and perhaps what you are doing now with your assignment right all of the neurons are um, fully connected so all of these layers are fully connected to the next layer whereas in these layers not all of them are connected it's, it's a convolution okay so fast forward to the F layer 6 the fully connected layer so the job of this including a softmax is to output my predictions my classes right class 0 to class 9 so 10 classes and the trainable items would be as simple as a multiplication of 120 multiply 84 which was the coming from the previous layer it was C5 and this one itself inside okay plus the bias term you have 84 as bias okay so that's a trainable item so in total if you see the the summary so for landed 5 For your input image, you have one feature map because it was grayscale. The size was 32 by 32. The first convolution, we had the stride of one, so we shift one by one when we were doing the convolution, right? One hop, one hop, one hop. This is for that. The activation was hyperbolic tangent. Okay. The second layer, we have average pulling. I talked about average average pulling for each of depending on the size of the kernel size. So 2 and 2 is it's going to divide this, output this to a 2 and 2. So depending on the size, uh, original size, it's going to divide it into 4. 
and for each of those subsections it's going to average those right and put one number so this would be here this would be here this would be here and this would be here okay so that's average pooling we have so it's going to average the values internally on each of the sub sections we have another one called max pooling that is going to simply put out the max value so if you use average pooling to downsample the size okay that's why we can come back to 14 by 14 from 28 by 28 and why this is divided by 2 because it's 2 multiplied 2 does that make sense okay All right, now there is a bigger convolution layer that has 16 feature maps, okay? And the size of the kernel of that layer is 10 by 10. So it's a 10 by 10 filter. You're going to stride it on the incoming input. Still with a stride of 1, okay? And then you do another average pooling. You're going to just, you are trying to just, you know, flatten your image and, and gain more high level features now. You see? You start bigger and then it's going to get flattened, flattened and then longer, okay? And finally, your, your last convolution has 120 feature maps, so 120 uh, third layer it has, for the size of 1-1. One, one. Um, and then the, the hyperbolic tangent will be the activation of that. Finally, you have uh, the fully connected layer. The last one also outputs the 10 classes that you were interested in predicting it, okay? So that the way, that's the way it goes. So if you put this, uh, all together, you can just see when an input image comes, oh. the first layer, it's going to receive 32, 32, 1. It's going to output 28 by 28, 6. The second one, you have the pooling layer. It's going to receive 28 by 28 and 6. And it's going to output 14 by 14 and 6. Right? You have the, the third CC, which is a convolution layer. A comp. So it's going to output 10 by 10 and 16, right? Because it has 16 channels with a stride of 1. Another pooling layer is going to downsize this 10 by 10 and 16 to 5 by 5 and 16. And then we're going to put, it, uh, put these two in C5 and C6 as two fully connected layers. This one passed to the, to the other one. And then finally, the softmax will output the classes. Okay? So this is the way Lenet 5 works. Uh, pretty advanced for the time, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Uh, but recently, we, we know that if you put all these average pullings next to each other without any other mo modification, we're going to lose some, uh, you know, prediction. But it was okay for uh, a single channel handwritten digit, right? It was performing well. Any questions? Yeah. So. If you have this, thirty-two, thirty-two, right, and the size of your filter is five by five, we just try the one with the padding zero. So you're gonna start here at five, and then each one you're gonna go forward, forward, right? If you, so this is this would be five and five. Okay, how many times you can go up the point that you hit the other end? It's 28 times, right? And it's 32 by 32, so this would be again 28 by 28. So that's, if, if we were to increase the stride to 2, it would have been 14, right? We would have missed. If we would have put the paddings like zeros here to, to compensate for the corners, it would have been an extra one. Uh, so there are different ways, right? Different design ways. Um, by yes, is 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 our granularity of the four iterator, right? So we 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 iterate by one.
pixel, one pixel, or two pixel, two pixels, yeah, or more. Just bring it big quick. Yeah, probably got to hundred and like two k connections. Do you just walk through the trainable parameters? So training parameters are just the ones that those are the the weights, yeah. right? Those are the weights that we have to train. And what are those? You have five and five of the filter itself, so it's a 3D filter, right? Yeah. This just pack them together at one, so it's a one 3D filter of five, five, and six. Yeah. Okay, so that's coming from this five, five, six, and then it's gonna be convolved onto the input image, which has only one depth, yeah. right? That's why it's gonna be convolved on this. It doesn't go anywhere in depth, so. You have to multiply it to one, which is uh, extra. So five, five, and six, and that plus six is the bias term. You see here is plus the bias term. Okay, weight and bias. Yeah. Okay, and so then twenty by twenty-eight. That's from. So this is the out. So this is the, this is the output that you pass as input oh, to the next layer. To the next layer. Yeah. So the next layer receives as if you were inputting a twenty-eight by twenty-eight by six. It doesn't know what happened before that. Okay, okay. so the the way you design a CNN, it's different than uh, a completely a fully connected layer. You have to make sure the input and output matches, and your hyperparam because of hyperparameter you chose. Um, does it have like a formula because you said twenty-eight? Like, um... A form to calculate that? Just just um, deduct the thirty-two minus. Um, uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you have to take into account the padding, and the way we, we do the padding. There are from there are similar, uh, very simple linear formulas. Perhaps you can come up with the, with your own. Yeah, perhaps if you Google, they're out there. But I haven't um, memorized any of those. I'm just looking at those and then see. Yeah, these are the, the, the and also note that the way we cross correlate or convolve here, it's um, is the one that I show in the previous lecture, which was ignoring the uh, the corners, right? We have another one called same, which is going to output the same because it's going to pad the corners, either by zeros, zero padding, or get a copy of the corner values and put it so that another another filter can map on that, OK? Is the, is the padding the number of the zeros? No, padding is a type of compensating the corners. So zero padding is one way. Um, there are multiple names. I, I, I forgot what, what was the other one. So another way is just you copy the value of the corner and put it next to each other again. So it's like you're, you're enlarging the, um, the image. And most of the time, it's, it's not useful. That's why zero padding works better. Okay. Yeah. Because at the end, it's going to help you to find some edges as well. But yeah, it, 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 again, it, it is dependent on the situation. So. Questions? All right, so fast forward. We go 2012 um, to graduate students of Jeffrey Hinton at U of T. They started to work on a very peculiar shape, and then they could outperform the the other competitors by like more than 10%. So their loss was uh, 27% or something. Five type top five uh, error rate. Double check. Uh, yeah, around so. Top one accuracy of AlexNet is around 50%, 55%. Uh, top five accuracy is around 70 two or three, so perhaps 20 something lost. Uh, whereas the second second best paper was like coming short 10% of this. So everyone was just wondering what happened. How did these guys can just outperform the, the runner up by this much? And so that was the reason. That was the first sort of deep convolutional neural network. And the weird thing is if you take a look at the paper, you have sort of two branches of convolutions that at the end they got back with fully connected layer. Does anyone know the historical reason for that? 
why this one got like in two branches, one up and one down. Because back then, 2011, uh, uh, GT500 NVIDIA was the best graphic card. And they couldn't fit both of them at the same time to the same card. So they had to split it in two. So that was a novelty of its own. So they had to split it into two graphic cards to train it. Uh, but nowadays, we can fit it, uh, fit ResNet in one 1060 NVIDIA easily. So that was one reason. All right. Um, so AlexNet, it has five convolutions and three, I believe uh, some of C's at the end, it was three. So you start, so now instead of 28 by 28, we are dealing with ImageNet images and we have to crop them. They're normally 29, 299 and 299, but for this network accepts 20, 224 by 224. So you have to crop the images in a way that it's going to work this way. If you work with TensorFlow or, or Cafe, people have already found the bounding boxes um, and also the, the mean and average for, for, uh, for all those millions of images. So you don't have to spend time. If you use with TensorFlow as well, there are pre-processed ready for AlexNet or Inception or different networks. But if you want to do it yourself, it's up to you to how to crop this to 224, 224, okay, as input. So the first layer has a convolution of 11 by 11, right? Some nonlinearity, an activation function, a norm um, layer, which was called LRN. Uh, so normally this layer is, is, is used to apply when we are dealing with ReLU neurons, okay, because um, ReLU neurons have unbounded activations and we need uh, LRN layers to normalize that, right? In general, we need to, we are trying to understand the high frequency features with a, with a high response. So if you normalize around the local neighborhoods this way, um, it becomes even more sensitive so that we can understand what, what group of neurons were activated or excited in each of the, the, the region. I actually forgot what LRN was standing for. So somebody Google Google that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Local response normalization. So it was uh, using this. All right, so we have that for layer one. Then you have uh, your, so 35K number of weight. So you see it has been enlarged by a long, long shot. Uh, you have another convolution, layer two. Layer T has three by three and some nonlinearity. Going up to these last three layers are FCs, all fully connected layers with one linearity. And then the output instead of 10 would be a thousand because that's for the ImageNet classes, right? Uh, normally we use one class for dummy as well. So if you play around with the, the framework is a thousand and one. So let's have a look at it in the summary. So each of the layers, filter size, number of filter at each layer. So that's, this would be 11 by 11 and 96, 5 by 5 and 256. And then uh, these are the number of channels a number of filters in each layer. So there are four different parameters for, for the convolution, right? Two of these, one and one. So there are 4D. But still, as I mentioned, the convolution is a 2D convolution. We have four tuple, actually. So the strides are, the first one was only four. To downsample it right away, to make it 11 by 11, and then the rest are one. And does anyone recall what max here stands for? I, I mentioned it some lectures ago. So these are actually the the, the, um, the metric to um, showcase the number of computations, right? It's max is standing for multiply, accumulate. Okay, the number of times you need to multiply and accumulate to generate that specific layer. So you see, there are a lot of lot of multiply, a lot of max, in order of millions now. Okay, AlexNet um, in, in model parameter, it was sort of expanded too much. 
in order of millions. So if you add them up, the last year was only four million. I guess AlexNet had yeah, sixty-one million. So it was um, non efficiently large. Number of parameters was very large. So so many optimizations when we do on neuro, uh, on CNNs like um, so these are advanced techniques, you don't need to know them. Like a sparsity or quantization, so on and so forth. This is one of the benchmarks that we can easily add, um, optimize because so many of those parameters could be uh, sort of cut because they were redundant. But for this time, it was a, a novelty as well. So remember now, we expanded from Uh, I don't have the values here. I have the final value for MNIST. Yeah, we expanded with the, with the order of Ks now up to 60 million weights and 624 million max. So it, it's computationally intensive. Questions? Yeah. So in terms of like design choices for this, are they mostly the like, kind of first they think about what are the features they want to track at each layer and then from there thinking about okay, what's a new filter that will capture this? Yeah, yeah, but when when you when you bring a filter to start with, um, it's up to you to start with the filter. But the the, the network will train the weight of that filter for you. The weight of the filter. Yeah. 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 But like, so, I mean, like choosing the size of the filter. And like yeah, the choosing the size of is is it, it, sort of a, uh, a trial and error to see what's going to be the output of each layer, how many layers you want, what's your time computation how much you want to spend on training time, what's your GPU size or CPU size. So these are different things. Yeah. There are so many. Now, one of the uh, hot research in uh, CNNs is NASNet, um, Google NAS. It's, uh, it's a research to how to f automatically fine-tuning fine the, the hyperparameters mm. of a CNN which is very, very computationally intensive so, because you have to instantiate a lot of networks and train each of those and find which one works the best. Mm -hmm. So this is a NAS research. Um, all right. Fast forward 2015, the runner-up of the um, ImageNet classification was a network called I Inception. And it, it, it was using a wider sort of network and each of those group of network was called an inception module, right? So that's what th that was why it was later known as Inception version one, two, three, and four. But since it was uh, produced uh, by Google, so it was named as GoogleNet. So GoogleNet is equal to it's the same as Inception. So both of them are the same model. Um, after this, we're going to talk about the winner of 2015, which is a which is a very interesting network of its own. So 2015 for Google Net or Inception, people started to realize why not we go wider instead of going deeper and deeper? Why not we group some smaller chunk of convolutions together and call them one inception instead of just expanding it in, in depth uh, and shallower, right? So each inception turned out to be uh, <coughs> a one by one, two by one by one convolution one three by three, one five by five, and one by one, and then you're gonna concate the output of all of those into the, into the filter that you wanna pass to the next one, right? So in Inception version one and two and three, you have at least five or six of these Inception modules um, inside your model. So you see now the, the trainable parameters has been shrunk a lot from 61 million of AlexNet now to up to only seven million Wait, while you're outperforming AlexNet by a large margin. Inception version 3, I believe it has 23 million, uh, and it still outperforms the other two, right? So, um, if you want to take a look at a sample code of this Inception layer, which includes all these 3x3, three 1x1, three, one one, and 5x5s, five is as if you define uh, a COM2D with a filter size of this with a hyperparameter of, you can see there's one max pooling 2D, another convolution, and another convolution, uh, another max pooling. So you can instantiate this with these hyperparameters. So for instance, uh, 
you have an input convolution 2D 64 7 by 7 with a stride of 2 then you have one max pooling another conf 2D conf 2D then after here is, is a whole chunk of inception module with all those 5, 5, and 3, 3, and 1, 1s. Again, you have another inception layer. So at this point, the network will get wider, right? Another inception layer, average pooling, and then you're flattening out to, to a fully connected layer and a softmax. So that was the way it was uh, designed. So in a high-level manner, you can see this. this. You see these, these areas are the areas you have inception module. You see it gets wider in this area but overall you have nine inception layers for um, 21 convolution in depth 57 total. For inception version 3 so I'm just gonna write inception v3 you had 94 coms plus one softmax so it was even longer than this and it was 23 mil. Questions? If you use TensorFlow, you can uh, you can use uh, a utility feature in TensorFlow called Tensor Board. You can uh, you can output graphs out of your network that you that you uh, design. Even in your current project, <coughs> you can output it using TensorBoard. It's gonna, it's gonna run a, a, on your browser, a locally, on a, I don't know, 8080 port. You can just have a look at it. I forgot. So you can see, and you can, it's gonna be clickable, and then it, you can zoom on that and see what are the parameters inside each layer and whatnot. Any questions for Inception? And NAS stands for Neural, Neural Architecture Search Network. So if you're searching for hyperparameters of a network. All right. So if you haven't been entertained enough, that's uh, that's a very sophisticated network to have a look at. If you didn't understand, that's okay. I'm not going to ask you for this on your finals. The idea was very, very interesting. Uh, so that was the winner of 2015. This paper has like more than 20,000 citations now. Uh, it was done by Facebook AI, by these authors. Um, so where to start? So ResNet stands for Residual Network. So they, they thought why not we add another branch of an input? So this is the flow of a network. You are having to look at it uh, top bottom. Okay. So this is coming here. So why not we have another branch and pass it directly as an identity X to the output of a group of learners, right? And then we add them together. So as if this one we are training to learn a function f using our network. Let's call it f of x using these submodules, right? And we are having a sort of a concurrent identity x to be added later on. So this point will output f of x, which was learned here, and an x, okay? So at this point, we have f of x plus x, as we call it h of x, okay? So they were thinking, um, First of all, there should be an, another uh, motivational slide, which is this. People have started to think if, uh, if we are making the networks deeper and deeper and deeper, so why not just go all in and then generate a very, very deep network? Perhaps it's going to learn better, right? But in practice, it's not the case. So this small-scale um, experimentation is showing you this, that on the left side, um, the training error and test error on the right. So on both cases, my error 
while I have more layers, 56 versus 20, is higher. If I don't, if I just put out all my network deeper and deeper and then pass these modules up to each other, next to each other, stack them up, it's not going to work as easy as it, as it thinks. Okay, so how are we going to compensate this error while we are still trying to learn more? Okay, and that was the the idea of a residual connection. So the core idea is, um, let us consider x, right, this x up to here, as an output of some convolutional layer, right? So we have done something up to here, and then this is this is the, the input of this specific uh, subnet. So we can add some more other convolutional layers here to reach up to this point, OK? On the other side, it should be a lot easier to learn a function f of x, which equals 0, right? Rather than an output of whatever it was meant to output here, which is f of x plus x, right? We call these residuals. So I'm sure we can find a network that when we train it, it's going to output a function f of x equal to 0. It's, it's easier to, to find a specifically the edge here, f of x plus x. So what was the idea behind this? Is rather than, rather than stack them up like this to go up to the next function, because at the end of the day, the, the whole idea of machine learning and neural network is to train this function, which was unknown, right? So if I add the residual block here and bring another copy of x up to this point, so am I going to lose something? No, at worst case, I'm going to have the same x that was bring, brought up here, right, to this point. Or I'm getting lucky. I'm doing something correct here. So this one will also add something to the x that was already brought in. So at the worst case, I'll have what? I'll have my x, which was already there, right? So if I make my network deeper and deeper, at least I have equally good result with my shallower model. Does that make sense? That was very philosophical, right? <laughs> so the idea was uh, when we're making the network stack up together and make it deeper and deeper, we don't lose that much of accuracy, just like you see here. The the error rate is higher when I make it deeper, right? I'm losing accuracy by making it deeper. But why not add a residual layer that maps an identity matrix X so that here at least I have equally good results before my even deeper convolutions. So that was, that was the idea. So by adding the residual block with respect to a plain deep block, they could see that now this is the this is the result for the plain version I'm just going to say plain just deep and this is the res version which is the residual version you see now when i add more layers i'm actually decreasing my error so that makes sense if i make it deeper now okay i'm not losing accuracy by making it just deeper because it's going to add just noise. Yeah, you can think about it more. Uh, this is a paper, if you Google it, it will show up. That's a very nice paper to read. Um, it might take some time, but you'll understand the, the idea. So that's a residual block. So it's kind of like a clock algorithm where that it kind of stores the information before things get bad. So if things get bad, you can just kind of correct it. Um, yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because here, we're going to make sure that using this residual block, uh, we can at least learn that um, identity that we brought up from before. We might be able to learn more, right? Okay. Um, so that was the winner of 2015. I kind of lost track of the, the other winners recently. Um, one of the, the state-of-the-art network after ResNet is called NASNet that I mentioned about the research. So it 
automatically update itself while it, it, it trains. So I, I guess it's, it has one of the highest um, accuracy. But um, up to here, you see the trend starting from 98 to 2015. You see the, the top five error of ImageNet decreased from 16.4 of AlexNet up to only 5%. So this is a huge um, victory. Uh, we have another version of ResNet, which is 120 something, and it has even lower than 5%, which was the human benchmark that I mentioned in the previous course. So this 50 is, is a number of convolution it was used in ResNet. So there are multiple versions of that. Also for this, we have version 2, 3, and 4, and the, the accuracy was a little bit increased. Also for VGD, we have another one called 19. Um, so these are the, uh, the variant of each model. So you can see number of weights. Uh, starting from only a number of Ks, we got expanded into millions. And the number of max are in the, in the order of giga, right? So that's why in the 90s, the ideas were, were sort of there, but the computations were not. So we didn't have hardware to train such a huge model here. So now you can train a ResNet from scratch using your 1060s uh, GPU, uh, perhaps in two weeks. In two weeks, you have, you have it trained on uh, ImageNet now with one GPU. Now there are so many papers that they, they use multiple GPUs to come up with the faster training methods. Um, I heard the news that the Japanese uh, researchers were, ma were able to train uh, ResNet in one hour or something. Yeah, so they were like uh, putting effort to, to make it in parallel. So, um, so that's a quick review. Hope you gain some insight. If you wanted to have a look at the other CNNs, so that, that's the paper of AlexNet. That was a NASNet that I mentioned um, earlier. This is one of the uh, latest network that you can have a look. And we almost got finished with the, the CNNs. Uh, you see, going back to the old good old classification of machine learning, we had supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, right? But the advancement of deep learning, each of those categories were adopted sort of itself with a new version of um, deep models. Like for computer vision, we have deep convolutional neural network or, or we say just CNNs. For language and text processing uh, or time series, sometimes we can use recurrent neural network or RNNs. Um, there's an extension of that called LSTMs. So next lecture on Monday, I'll talk about RNNs. Um, and some more advanced unsupervised learning models called, called GANs, or Generative uh, Adversarial Networks, um, and also um, autoencoders. I wish we had time to talk about these two, but they're outside the scope of this course. Feel free to have a look at these two uh, on the deep learning book as your reference. So the author of uh, the deep learning book is actually the author of GANs. So, um, so it's a nice uh, reference for that. And also, just like for reinforcement learning, we have a, a branch, a deep branch of that called deep reinforcement learning. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's outperforming. So that was the agent in AlphaGo team that uh, they could win the, the competition in, in the United Kingdom. Any questions for this course now, lecture? All right, uh, I'm going to stop here. So uh, if you haven't turned in your paper, please do so. If you forgot to bring it, bring it next week. Please work on your assignment two. Assignment three would be CNN, so you're going to still be using TensorFlow. And then on Monday, I'll start talking about RNNs. Okay, have a